So I was watching the CNN town hall with James Comey last night when Comey told this surprising story about when he was a high school senior. A serial rapist and robber kicked in the front door to my parents' home and ended up taking my brother and me captive and at one point lying us down on the, my parents' bed and just pointing the gun at the back of our heads. Comey escaped, obviously, as did his brother, but no sooner did I hear that story than I went online and found out that the so-called Golden State Killer had been captured, a man accused of at least 12 murders, 45 rapes, and dozens of burglaries across California from 1974 to 1986. Police say they matched Joseph D'Angelo's DNA from a discarded sample outside his home to a sample from the investigation. We found the needle in the haystack. And it was right here in Sacramento. After almost 40 long years, a dark mystery finally solved. But why did it take so long? And what of the remaining mysteries in this area? The new Bedford Highway killer suspected of at least nine deaths in the late 80s. Or the Connecticut River Valley killer believed to have killed at least seven people from the late 70s to the late 80s. I'm joined now by one of the country's preeminent authorities on the subject, James Allen Fox. He's co-author of Extreme Killing, Understanding Serial and Mass Murder, among his other books. He's also a professor with Northeastern University's Criminal Justice Program, which is celebrating... It's 50th year anniversary, is that right? That's right. Congratulations. Thank you very much. That is really And I've been great. there 42 of them. Uh, have, no, how long have you been there? 42 years. Have you really? Yeah, since congratulations I was a young kid, you basically. Too. Come back in eight years and we'll give you your 50th year. <laughs> but congratulations, all of you. It's great. Is it a stupid question for me to ask why it took so long? No, because back then we didn't have the technology and the tools of investigation that we have today. You know, DNA, for example, wasn't first mm. used in forensic purposes till 1988. So we, we, back in the 70s and in the 80s, this country was awash with serial killers. Bundy and Gacy, you know, you know all the names. But since then, actually, we have far fewer serial killers. Yeah, I read you that you wrote that. Why, yeah. why is that? Well, partially is that uh, Americans are more cautious. Uh, the stranger danger. They don't hitchhike anymore. Uh -huh. uh, but a big part of it is that the police have all these tools, and there are cameras everywhere, and we have DNA, and we have DNA databanks. So it's much harder for a would-be serial killer to stay at large for a long enough period of time so they can amass the body count and become one of the top type killers. Is it also possible that on the sex crime end of things that the Internet provides an outlet for some of these guys, or is that... No, that, that is also a possibility, too, that it's much easier today to, to gratify a sexual sadist's needs than before. There are people out there, of course, who, for, for the right price, will play the role uh, that will satisfy a, a sexual cases. sadist. You but know, then there are some sexual sadists for whom nothing short of killing understood. will please them. You know, when you mentioned 70s and 80s, the thing that's most amazing, I think, to me, of this whole deal mm -hmm. is assuming that it's accurate. He does all this, causes all this mayhem and carnage in the 70s and 80s, and then theoretically just stops yeah. in 1986. If that's true, does that happen often? And if it does, what, he's satisfied because I did enough, I killed enough people, I raped <laughs> enough women? How does that happen? Well, remember the BTK killer? Yes, uh, yes. Uh, who stopped? He stopped basically because he got a, the kind of job that gave him the power he wanted. He always wanted to become a police officer, and he didn't have what it took, took to, to get that kind of a job. But eventually he got the job as a compliance officer, and he could write tickets to the neighbors for having their lawn too long. And that gave him satisfaction. Finally, he had that kind of power over other people, and he stopped killing. Now, in, in, the, in the Golden State Killer case, a lot of it can have, can have to do with, with changes in lifestyle, uh, aging process. Uh, but you just stop? Yeah. I mean, he wasn't an occasional stop. rapist yeah. and murderer. Sure. He was a constant rapist and murderer. And it can also be that he becomes spooked by thinking they're going to get me. Mm. Remember, there was this composite sketch. Uh, you know, he yeah. was a police officer, so he had some clue as to what was going on in terms of uh, police investigative tools. Can I, can I, uh, yeah. the corollary question that goes with that for me is not just how do you stop, yeah. but then how do you live a quasi-normal existence where the neighbors, they may think you're odd, but you're not, mm -hmm. they don't think you're a killer. I mean, is that odd when they do stop? Uh, serial killers <clears throat> and sociopaths in general, if he is one, are very good at compartmentalization. Mm. You know, 
putting aside what they do as their hobby and their other part of their lives where they can actually be caring toward the people they care about. It's, uh, you know, the Nazis, for example, the Nazi SS killers, during the day they were these ruthless men who did all sorts of experiments on the Jews, but at night they went home to their wives and families. They could separate and compartmentalize the people they cared about and everyone else who was expendable. So it's very easy for someone like that to have two basic sides to the personality, the sadistic side that played out with his victims, and then the other side where, that he was during the day, basically, with his friends and neighbors. You know, every time something like and this happens and someone gets captured, mm -hmm. I think of you or your former great colleague, Jack Levin, and say, when they learn about this guy, and it's almost all guys, yeah. do they say, aha, all that makes sense? What makes sense quickly here and what doesn't make sense in this guy? Well, people might be surprised about the fact that he was a police officer, but that may partially explain his personality. You know, not all police officers, certainly. Most police officers go into the business because they want to help people. But there are some who go into that line of work because they want the power. They want the uniform. They want the badge. They want the gun. Mm -hmm. They want to control people. And so there have been a number of serial killers who want to become police officers. And there have been some who have been security guards. They like that power. Do you worry? I mean, you and I have talked through the years about copycat stuff. Mm -hmm. uh, we're on opposite. You're with Anderson Cooper to a degree on this don't name, don't show photographs, to at least to excess. I think it's ridiculous. I don't have your expertise. Do you worry about yeah. copycats in a situation like this? We all know his name. Yeah. His picture is going to be up nonstop. Do you yeah. worry in a case like this? Not in this case particularly because it, it, so someone old? who is, <laughs> someone, it takes a lot to get to the point where you desire to rape and sodomize and murder people. Just seeing some other guy out there being in the news isn't going to make you into a sexual sadist. I, by the way, I will agree with you. See, I, I don't think that the name is a big deal. So it's it's a name. Did I mischaracterize your position? What I care about is, is when we start uh, getting too much information about. So let's, let's take the Las Vegas killer. We know what his favorite games, casino games were. Yeah. We know about his wedding, his marriages, what jobs he had. I agree with that. At a certain point, it's not news anymore, it's celebrity watch. And I, it, it's to the well, point also almost normalizes him when he's got a lot right, of qualities right. that we have. We know more about him than our next-door neighbor. That's so I think we cross a line sometimes when we, when we basically create this person who, and, and humanize that person. The name is fine, the photo is fine, that doesn't drive copycats. It's the celebrity that does. Got it. Last thing, I, I mentioned a couple of unsolved serial crimes here. Yep. Do we learn anything in 2018 from a, a, an investigation like this that might help people, law enforcement, people here? Or are they all just separate kinds of yeah, things? I think they're all separate. In this particular case, they haven't said how they suspected him. See, the problem situation like this, they had the DNA I from know. the crime scene, but he wasn't in any DNA databanks, and most people aren't. So you have to first find the, the subject, and then you can test the DNA. And getting the DNA in people is very easy, mm -hmm. you know, because once Honestly. you throw something away like a paper cup, you, it no, that no longer belongs to you. So I don't think we've learned anything about, from this case about surveillance. It's just great that they finally caught the guy, mm -hmm. assuming he is the guy, and there's some justice for those victims. James, thanks. And again, congratulations on 50 years. Thank to you. you and your colleagues. Well-deserved.